Hello everyone and welcome to today's Knowledge is Great lecture. If nature is the solution, what is the problem? My name is Leighton Ernstberger and I'm the Director of Education and English at the British Council in East Asia based here in Singapore. The Knowledge is Great lecture series was launched in 2015 by the British Council in Singapore. It showcases the UK's knowledge, creativity and innovation by inviting leading UK specialists to speak on areas of topical debate and discussion. If you have joined us on these lectures before, you will know that we will be running these lectures once a month uh, for the rest of this year, typically on the last Thursday of each month whenever possible. So do look out for our invitation to, to future lectures. Before we begin today's session, could I please go over some housekeeping information? Uh, we will have more than 150 participants joining the session today, so please put your microphones on mute unless you wish to speak. I'll pause here for a moment to let you check that your microphones are on mute. Please turn your video cameras off as well so that we can conserve bandwidth. A quick run through the program. First, I will invite uh, Her Excellency Miss Cara Owen, British High Commissioner to Singapore, to introduce our speaker for this evening, Professor Harriet Bulkley. Professor, uh, uh, Professor Bulkley will then deliver her lecture. If you have any questions that you would like to pose to Professor Bulkley, you could type these into the chat box, or in, indeed, uh, if you raise your hand, then I will ask you to unmute your, your microphone so that you can ask a question. Uh, Professor Bulkley will uh, try to address as many of these as she can after her lecture. If you see a question that you like, by the way, coming through on the chat, um, please do like that question, um, as that will help me to understand, you know, which are the best and most urgent questions to ask. We will aim to close the session right on time. Please take note that we are recording the session for the uh, for the benefit of those who could not attend. Please note. Um, on accessibility of this session. Ms. Rashida from the Singapore Association for the Deaf will be providing Singapore Sign Language interpretation during the lecture. Hopefully you can see uh, Ms. Rashida's video. Uh, if you can, please pin uh, Rashida's video to your screen if you would like to access the interpretation. You can do this by right-clicking on the three dots icon next to Rashida's video and then selecting the pin option. You could also choose to turn on closed captions. For this, right click on the top three dots at the top of your screen, right next to the chat icon. Scroll down and click on the CC icon. The captions will not be 100% accurate, but they could still be useful. So without further ado, let us begin. I'm very pleased to introduce you all to Her Excellency, Ms. Cara Owen. Ms. Owen has been the British High Commissioner to Singapore since June 2019. Prior to this, she was the director for the Americas at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and has served as deputy head of mission at the British embassies in Paris and Hanoi. She has been awarded a CVO, Commander of the Victoria Cross, and CMG, Champion of St. Michael and St. George by Her Majesty, the Queen for Services to Diplomacy. Ms. Owen graduated from the University of Sheffield with a BA in History. She holds an MSc from the London School of Economics and Diplomacy and International Strategy and an MSc from Cranfield University in International Human Resource Management. Alongside her diplomatic work, she has focused on diversity and inclusion uh, uh, and organizational development. Her High Commissioner will provide this evening's opening address and will then introduce our speaker. Over to you, High Commissioner. Thank you so much, Leighton, and thank you, Rashida, for your um, interpretation. Let me know if I'm going too fast, please. Uh, and I just have to correct one little thing in your lovely introduction, which is to make sure that nobody has the impression that I have a Victoria Cross of any kind, which is given for uh, massive amounts of bravery. I have, um, I'm a, a commander of the Victoria Order, but I just wanted to make that clear, lest somebody thought that I'd been more heroic than I have. Um, I am really delighted uh, to be here and good evening everybody, good morning to those of you who joined us from the UK. It's great to welcome you to the lecture. As Leighton has just said, the British Council Knowledge is Great lectures are real opportunities for academics, practitioners, students and also the general public 
to engage in stimulating discussions on a wide range of topics in arts, science, the environment and more. And we're just getting to the end of a series of three, which has been focused very much around climate change and the environment. Um, great lectures typically explore topics of significant interest both to the UK and to Singapore and indeed um, many of those actually dock into issues that uh, concern countries uh, across the world. With a steady drumbeat of activities around climate change in the run-up to uh, November's 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference of the Parties, which we call COP26 in Glasgow, hosted by the UK, these lectures provide us all with a chance to get behind the headlines and the sound bites and consider some of the broader and deeper uh, ideas, considerations, questions that are presented um, by uh, this topic. Just last month, Singapore unveiled its Green Plan 2030, a whole of nation movement to advance the national agenda on sustainable development. The plan comprises ambitious and concrete targets over the next 10 years aimed at strengthening Singapore's commitments under the UN's 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and the Paris Agreement. And I can confirm that in my conversations that I'm having in a on a daily basis with uh, academics, members of the government, uh, MPs, um, uh, private sector leaders, it is impossible for me to be having a conversation at the moment without talking about climate and sustainability in some way. Climate change is an issue that Singapore agrees is really important, uh, to, on which we have to mobilise the diversity and ingenuity of all talent, including uh, that of young people. Last week, I was really delighted to welcome Minister of Sustainability and Environment Grace Fu to the first ever um, UK organised Singapore Youth Climate Dialogue. Um, we co-hosted that with Italy, who is our partner in COP26. One of the big messages I took away was how young people saw the urgency of the task of upskilling tomorrow's leading professionals in climate literacy and expertise. And I hope that this lecture can be part in some small way of that much bigger effort. I was also honoured to address the opening ceremony of the Nanyang Technological University's Model United Nations Conference this year uh, and gave a lecture to an environmental science masters at the National University of Singapore this week. They pressed me to give evidence and data to back up the UK's claims to climate leadership and they pressed me also on how to accelerate the action globally and within ASEAN and show themselves alive to the risk we are taking in not managing to achieve uh, that increased ambition. It was truly inspiring to be part of such platforms and to engage in constructive discussions in support of universal calls to action that will help us address our collective sustainable development goals. Tackling climate change demands a global coordinated response and the UK on this are really like-minded. We are committed and close partners on climate change. COP26 will bring together over 30,000 delegates, including heads of state and government, climate experts and campaigners to agree on coordinate, coordinated action to tackle climate change. And our ambition for this is as high as it should be if you had the expectations of the planet riding on your shoulders. In its presidency of COP26, the UK is clear that fighting climate change is a pressing priority for everyone and demands a global effort. Singapore has expressed its strong support for the UK presidency and both countries have agreed to work closely with each other and other parties to secure a successful outcome across the board. Initiatives such as the Youth Climate Dialogue, NTU's Model UN and the British Council's Great Lectures are important opportunities to engage uh, um, young people and the wider public on climate change issues. The Great Lectures allow us to examine different perspectives, challenges and solutions surrounding these issues. Turning to the topic of today's lecture, in January this year, Dr Ivan Haig from the University of Southampton spoke to some of the steps that we would take to reduce the stresses our oceans are facing. His lecture was about rising tides, sustainability across our blue planet. Last month, uh, sorry, in February, 
Um, uh, yes, we're still in March, aren't we? Uh, uh, in February, Professor Ian uh, Ilan Kelman from University College London um, gave a lecture about is climate change really that bad? He continued the theme of the first lecture of environmental sustainability and climate change and took us through some of the subtleties and complexities we ought to consider when trying to address the effects of human action or inaction on nature. Globally, there's been growing interest in the possibilities that nature-based solutions can offer to help address multiple sustainable development goals. For example, it's been estimated that nature-based solutions can provide up to a third of the mitigation needed to hold global average temperature rise to below the two degrees Celsius target in the Paris Climate Agreement. I remember reading an interesting article in Channel News Asia recently, which referenced how planting mangrove forests to complement seawalls could slow the tide and provide some mitigation against rising sea levels, an example of a nature-based solution that Singapore could adopt to deal with the effects of climate change. Dr. Haig also spoke of the Thames Barrier um, uh, near London in his lecture in January. The Thames Barrier was built to protect London from floods. Um, it has been closed 195 times since it became operational in 1982. Could there be a nature-based solution to this requirement similar to what Singapore is considering? I would love to hear more, as I'm sure would all of you. So today, I'm going to now I'm going to turn to Professor Harriet Bulkley from Durham University, who um, is doing us a real honour in joining us today to talk about some of these nature-based solutions. Just a few words of introduce, introduction uh, to the professor. She holds joint appointments as professor in the Department of Geography at Durham University and to the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development in Utrecht University. She has published widely in the fields of environmental guide, governance and the politics of climate change, energy and sustainable cities, and has been listed as one of the world's most highly cited researchers since 2016. She currently coordinates the uh, H2020 Naturvation project, examining the role of urban innovation with nature-based solutions for sustainable development. Professor Bulkley held the King Carl uh, um, Gustav XVI Professorship in Environmental Science in 2014, and she has been recognised by the Royal Geographical Society for the impact of her work on climate policy. In 2019, she was elected as a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and as a Fellow of the British Academy. We truly have a star in our midst. Professor Bulkley, we are absolutely delighted you are with us here today and we really look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Many thanks. Thank you, Cara, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you today as part of the great lecture series and so glad also to see that this lecture series has been turning attention to this very critical issue around climate change. Now in, in the tradition of online meetings I'm now going to share my slides and hope that this is going to work well for us all and so I hope that you can see them now. So today I want to explore this question of nature-based solutions and I've always been intrigued ever since I came to start working on this topic of how and why have we come to think of nature as being the solution to the problems that society is actually causing to nature? So it seems to me kind of a strange phenomenon that we're turning to nature as a solution to the problems that we're causing in nature. And so this is uh, the topic that I want to explore today to think how has this come about? And what does this mean? And indeed, what is the underlying problem with nature based solutions? Um, and can we move them forward in such a way that they can really offer a proper solution to the challenges that we face together? So some of you might remember this picture taken at the beginning of 2020. It does seem an awful long time ago now. It encapsulates to me what was core and forefront of our agenda as we came into 2020, looking ahead at what were planned to be two important uh, conferences, one on climate change, COP26 conference to be held in Glasgow, and one to be held in Kunming in China uh, on the Biodiversity Convention. So it, 2020 then heralded as a golden year for climate and for nature, the first time in which these two agendas had really been brought together. Of course, 2020 didn't really pan out as we were expecting, and all of us are 
still uh, coping with, with the effects of the pandemic. But in some senses, these questions of climate and nature have come even more to the fore through our experiences of the last year. And what we've seen during this time is the rise and indeed increasing rise of nature as a solution, as I suggested in my initial introduction. This coincidence of two major United Nations conferences, increasing attention given to the idea of net zero targets for reducing emissions. So net zero targets means not only reducing our greenhouse gas emissions from uh, our homes, from our industry, but making sure that those emissions are uh, compensated where we can't reduce them anymore through such strategies as planting forests or seagrass or retaining peat bogs or uh, retaining areas of forest and, and converting land to new uses that uh, absorb carbon, if you like, from the atmosphere. So the net zero targets agenda plus a growing role for non-state actors who do not see these agendas in separate terms and don't have enough time and resources to be tackling them separately. Certainly in, in the work that I do, and perhaps uh, as Cara was saying about all of the different conversations that she's been having with businesses and other leaders and youth about these uh, problems around sustainability, many of the actors that I speak to say, we just don't have time to do climate change on Monday and then uh, look at the challenges of biodiversity on Tuesday and then think about water issues on Wednesday. We need to do them in an integrated way because that's the way that we're going to be able to most efficiently address them. And together then, this coincidence of the major conferences, net zero targets, and this idea that these agendas are increasingly intertwined in the everyday practices of the actors who are really making a difference on the ground, nature is becoming positioned as a solution for both uh, the climate challenge and the biodiversity challenge. There's a bit of a subtle difference in the definitions that are used. So we see a definition of natural climate solutions given here from the Nature for Climate Coalition, which is a group of leading conservation organisations and uh, environmental business organisations such as the World Business Council. Proven ways of reducing carbon emissions and storing them in the world's forests, grasslands and wetlands. You can see the rest of the definition there. Whereas nature based solutions are a slightly broader term, inspired and supported by nature, cost effective, and they provide environmental, social and economic be benefits, building resilience, bringing more and more diverse nature into cities, landscapes and seascapes with benefits for biodiversity. So if you like, we can see natural climate solutions as a subset of the overall discussion of nature based solutions, particularly focused on the climate problem, whereas nature-based solutions have a bit of a broader agenda. Now, on the one hand, we can say, well, so far, so good. Bringing nature into our, more into our cities, bringing nature you know, onto the top of the agenda, thinking about nature as a means through which we can address these challenges, that's got to be good, right? But on the, sun, on the other side, people are starting to raise some challenges by that turning to nature-based solutions might involve. The first is a challenge that perhaps this agenda is being a bit hijacked by climate change. And as somebody who's worked on climate change and climate change governance for nearly 30 years now, thinking of something as being hijacked by climate change is a, a bit difficult because it's such an important issue. But on the other hand, there are concerns that nature focused on a climate solution can become so sort of focused on that, that other things such as biodiversity may not be taken into consideration. So you could have a climate change solution such as a monocrop plantation that addressed the climate issue of absorbing carbon, but did very little for other challenges such as biodiversity. And there are also concerns that those whose land and resources are being positioned as solutions for climate change through natural climate solutions, through nature-based solutions, may not see any of these benefits themselves. So this is a question which we would call appropriation, that people's um, forests, their land, their resources, their sacred spaces are being used for other people's purposes. There are also concerns that nature-based solutions, like many other um, responses to the climate change issue, may be some form of greenwash. Are nature-based solutions being used, as this cartoon suggests, um, by big businesses to avoid the challenge of emissions reductions? Is it fine to carry on uh, digging as much oil out of the ground as we like while we continue to plant trees? 
And then there's another related question, which is, are natural climate solutions reliable enough over the long term for decarbonisation? And this means that rather than just focusing on how many trees we plant, we've got to think about how many trees we grow. So, or how many mangrove forests or how much peat bog restoration we do, we've got to think about it over the long term. So these issues have been really the focus of how, while nature may be a solution to the challenges we currently face, it may not be the whole solution and it may also generate more problems. But what I want to do in the rest of today's session is to say, well, actually, maybe part of the problem with nature-based solutions is not that there are too many nature-based solutions, as these kind of concerns suggest, but maybe there aren't enough and maybe we're not looking in the right places for them. This is the kind of image. This is a peat bog uh, somewhere in Germany, I think, where I've uh, taken a picture from from a from a stock library of such images. Where we use this is the kind of thing that we usually think about when we think about nature based solutions, restoring landscapes so that they can fulfill their full uh, ecosystem functions, in this case, to store carbon in a in a working peat bog. We don't so much see on the international agenda discussing nature based solutions or natural climate solutions, solutions such as this one taken from a suburb in uh, Malmo in Sweden, Augustenborg, where the whole development of low income housing has been done with nature based solutions in mind to allow the city to adapt to increasing rainwater events. And maybe we don't think about this kind of forest, an urban forest, this one planted in Melbourne by a community in its neighbourhood in order to help reduce the heat island effect that this community was facing. Or indeed this one, which is perhaps one of my favourite ones. This is a group, a picture of a group of volunteers who are planting oyster reefs, it, part of an initiative in New York to build natural defences uh, towards sea level rise. And maybe this is the kind of thing that we need to be thinking of doing around the Thames barrier, as Cara introduced in the beginning of this session. But these kind of urban nature based solutions are often overlooked. When we think about the financing, when we think about the policy attention, we think about the government attention that's going to nature based solutions, we rarely hear about what cities can do working with nature based solutions. And this is important because cities are critical for meeting the climate challenge. They're sites of high levels of energy use and consumption, and they are also sites of large degrees of vulnerability to, to climate change. And urban nature based solutions really can support climate mitigation, particularly in terms of cooling. We know that uh, demand for cooling will increase significantly over the next 30 years. And one of the things that we often talk about with nature based solutions is that they can deliver multiple benefits for cities. Uh, so we think about nature based solutions as being useful, interesting kinds of responses to climate change and other sustainability challenges because they address more than one problem at once. But of course, if we want those benefits to be shared by people, the nature based solutions need to be close to the, the people who will benefit from them. And this also means that nature based solutions in cities can provide a really important means of fostering new connections to and values for nature that in turn can drive wider environmental action. So uh, I suppose one of the things that uh, we've been doing in the Naturevation project, which is funded by the European Commission as part of a whole suite of projects uh, across the European Union and the UK, um, interested in furthering nature based solutions in cities is to think about what will it take for nature based solutions in cities to become a real part of the solution. And one of the things that we've done in the uh, Naturevation project, which is uh, shortly coming to an end, is we've developed what we call an urban nature atlas. And this is an atlas so far predominantly focused in the European Union, where we've collected uh, examples from 100 different cities. We've got a thousand different examples of nature based solutions and looked at how they're addressing sustainability challenges. And what we can see is that urban nature comes in all shapes and sizes. Parks and urban green areas, as you expect, are very important, but so too are a whole set of other kinds of nature based solutions. Uh, external building greens, as we call it, and that's not spinach or lettuce on the outside of your building, but we're talking about green walls and green roofs here. Green areas for water management becoming really much more important than they used to be in cities. And this is about adapting to high rainfall events. I think one of the really interesting things that we found is just how many 
derelict areas of land there are in European cities that are being used proactively to bring nature into cities and manage some of the effects of climate change and also to ensure new spaces for biodiversity, um, amenity, to enhance uh, social well-being, health and so on. And we can see this is a really accelerating trend over the last uh, 30 years. I always have to check when 1990 really was because it seems still not 30 years ago to me. Uh, but we can see a real rapid rise in nature-based solutions being developed in Europe in European cities, particularly since the late 2000s. But when we came to look at which kinds of sustainable development goals urban nature-based solutions in Europe were tackling, we started to see a bit of a, uh, what we like to call an opportunity gap. Uh, so we can see that nature-based solutions in European cities are very much focused on questions of green space and biodiversity, but also interestingly on regeneration, urban development and health and well-being. So these issues that matter to communities, economic regeneration, health and well-being, green space are really top of the agenda and that's brilliant to see. But at the same time, other concerns such as environmental quality, water management and climate action, where we know that nature-based solutions have significant potential, are not being so much put on the agenda. So this could mean that there's a lot of nature-based solutions work happening in cities around the world, which has not yet fulfilled its potential for improving environmental quality, water management and climate action. And equally, what we tend to find is that those initiatives that focus on the more environmental goals, climate, water, environmental quality and so on, tend to be lacking in terms of their focus on health, regeneration or questions of social justice or cultural heritage. And as you can see, some of the other sustainable development goals on the bottom half of this diagram are much less addressed. And so what we think is, is happening is that nature-based solutions are being driven by single agendas, where really there is a potential for them to address multiple agendas at once. And so what we've been working on in the project is, is looking at, well, what can we do to ensure not only that nature-based solutions are being implemented in cities, but they reach their full potential. So they become real parts of the solution to this urban sustainability challenge. And our approach is informed uh, by work on sustainability transitions, which suggests that what we need to look at is both how we enable innovation, but also how we address the structural conditions within which innovations of this kind thrive. So we've looked at forms of governance that we need, uh, business models that can support uh, the capturing of value and how this is shared and dispersed between public and private actors, finance and active citizen engagement. And I haven't got time in today's session to tell you about all of this. And I should at this point also uh, make clear that this Naturevation project has been something undertaken between 14 different partners and about 80 researchers working on it for nearly five years. So there's an awful lot of work that's gone into this. Um, certainly not all of my own. But what so I just wanted to share with you this idea of the business models that we've looked at. And here really, I think maybe you know, we struggled a little bit with finding the right term for this because it's not a, a model that businesses only should use. It's a model that is about capturing the value that nature-based solutions have and enabling that value to be visible and to be shared and both, if you like, monetary returns and other kinds of returns on that value to be recognised. And these are just four of the different business models or value capture models, which might be a more accurate way of talking about them, that we found when we've looked at 54 detailed case studies across the world, um, including in China, in South Africa, in Mexico, Canada, the US, as well as our European case studies. Um, and here that we found, say, risk reduction is a really important role for nature-based solutions in a way in which their value can really be celebrated. Local stewardship, how the value that citizens and businesses place in their local uh, nature, green densification, urban development models, which bring nature-based solutions right into the heart of what they're doing, and also, of course, green health, and something, of course, that has been to the forefront of the pandemic, even though this is work uh, that we did starting about four years ago on these value capture models. It turns out that the green health one was even more valuable than we thought. The other thing, aside from growing innovation with nature-based solutions, what we also have been looking at is what it will take to mainstream urban nature-based solutions. And here, 
we think there's a huge amount of work to be done in terms of making sure that nature-based solutions are visible um, and their value and their potential is seen. So this is uh, hot off the press, this, this work. And again, I would like to claim absolutely no credit for, for this. I don't want you to go away with the impression that I'm the kind of geographer that can do a map of this kind, because I certainly am not. But luckily, I know people who can. Uh, so this is a map of Malmo uh, that I mentioned before. And here, my colleagues are working at Lund University, just up the road from Malmo, and in partnership with the Malmo City Council, have mapped the potential of different nature-based solutions across the whole city at an incredible uh, level of resolution. And what you can do with a tool, which is available on our website, is you can run different kinds of scenarios. So what is the challenge that you're trying to address? Are you looking at flood risk reduction or, or cooling in the city? And then what kinds of different combinations of nature-based solutions can deliver the more um, benefits towards those goals? We've done this detailed mapping for three cities in Europe, Malmo, Utrecht uh, in the Netherlands and Barcelona in Spain. Uh, we've also done scenario mapping for something like 720 urban areas across the European Union. And we think that these tools and techniques which are able to give planners and policymakers a really detailed view of the potential of nature-based solutions is going to be one key aspect of mainstreaming. We've identified another 19 different things that we need to do to mainstream nature-based solutions also uh, now on our website. And we're working with different organisations, uh, both at a national level, at a local level, and also internationally, to think about how we can uh, help to mainstream nature-based solutions on the basis of the knowledge that we're generating in the project. One of the key things for us, though, as we seek to bring nature-based solutions to the forefront and we seek to mainstream them, is to ensure that in doing so, we don't produce more unequal cities than we have at the moment. We know that nature-based solutions are valuable. We know that they can produce multiple forms of benefit. Um, and the focus on these benefits may lead to some other issues being neglected, as I've said before. But what we're really critically um, interested in is that evidence tells us that as nature-based solutions are put into cities, the value of the land, the value of the housing rises. And that this can lead to forms of gentrification, which serve to exclude communities, People can no longer afford to live in these places and they can no longer afford the rents. Um, so ensuring that nature-based solutions don't generate these kinds of um, unintended side effects of making some parts of cities more inhabitable, more pleasant to live in, with access to the health and well-being and climate protection benefits that nature brings and excluding other communities from that has got to be forefront of this agenda. And bringing communities in from the outset, involving them in the design and implementation of nature-based solutions, ensuring just and equitable access to nature-based solutions, and also making sure that where nature-based solutions are profitable in one part of a, a city being uh, developed through the market, that some forms of, of compensation in terms of nature and biodiversity in other parts of cities are considered are some of the things that we think could help to offset the potential inequalities that nature-based solutions can bring. So we, you know, looking at what makes for successful nature-based solutions that can address these justice issues. Um, we've developed this sort of, uh, I suppose it's, yeah, uh, it's a figure, but it's also a metaphor to say that the nature-based solutions that are going to grow the most strongly, that are going to provide the the deepest roots that are going to have the longevity that we need them to have are those that have the most of these principles embedded. And from our case study work, we've seen that where nature-based solutions are both, say, ambitious and inclusive, are both most relevant to local communities and transparent, they grow deeper roots, they last longer, and they're more resilient to change in cities. And one of the things, you know, that we have also noticed and, and uh, what I'd like to end on is a lot of the discussion about what nature-based solutions might mean is has been very much focused on all of these you know critical services that they can provide but at the same time we've got to remember that at the end of the day one of the things that matters the most about bringing nature-based solutions into our cities is how much nature in our urban communities means to us and I think many of us will have experienced that. Different degrees of lockdown, of course, have existed across the world. 
um, for many of those of us who've experienced large uh, portions of the last year under conditions of lockdown, one of the things that has been very valuable to us has been uh, the nature in and around us. But also one of the things maybe that we've missed is nature in other cities that we know and love. Um, this is an example from Melbourne, where some of my family live. And uh, Melbourne, in their urban forest strategy, developed a means that the members of the public could let the council know whether the trees were healthy or not. And what they found out was that rather than just letting the council know that this tree needed a bit more water, people started to write love letters to their favourite trees. And I particularly love this one because it comes from someone in New York who is missing their tree in Melbourne. And I think it's quite an, a sort of poignant reminder that we love nature everywhere, wherever we're based. So thinking about then how we move towards real solutions with nature based solutions, you know, how we how do we make nature based solutions a real solution for the multiple challenges that we're facing and how do we make sure that their urban side can be really embedded in the COP26 summit and beyond. So we we need to see that as leaders pledge more money for these natural solutions that in this rush to respond to climate change, we also forget we don't forget, sorry, that we need to address biodiversity and broader questions of sustainability around health and well-being at the same time. And I'm sure this is, you know, this is definitely on the agenda, but we need to know that just because we're using the natural climate solutions doesn't mean that necessarily these other benefits will be taken into account unless we do so purposefully. And we need to put cities onto this agenda. They're crucial and they're currently neglected site for nature-based solutions in these uh, preparations for COP26 and in the preparations for COP15. And natural solutions here can address these multiple challenges and engage communities. And we think there's a significant opportunity here to achieve diverse sustainability goals. But at the same time, we must make sure that questions of social justice and the diverse connections to nature that different communities want to make can be front and centre of this effort. And thank you again for uh, inviting me. And uh, yeah, I will stop sharing my slides now and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Buckley. That was really insightful and has certainly given us a lot to think about. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left for questions, so obviously I do want to leave a bit of time for thank yous at the end. Uh, we'll certainly obviously aim to finish on time. Uh, for me, it was great to sort of hear, I mean, I always think it's important to, to ensure we understand what we mean by a term, especially a term that's becoming a, a bit more buzzy than perhaps it was before. Um, I'm also intrigued to hear about a uh, reference that you put in there to unintended out outcomes. So, you know, we can have good intentions, but it's not always that the outcome is, is what we intend. Um, and I was also struck by one of your earlier slides uh, that showed the adoption of nature-based solutions, you know, from the 90s to now. And, and, and I wonder what stories the dips in that trend line sort of tells us. Um, but maybe linking to that, and it could be around unintended qu consequences, it could be to do with terminology. But one of the questions that we had uh, prior to the session, and uh, just a comment for all of those listening, please do like the questions you want to be asked um, or uh, type in your own questions. But one of the questions that was asked before by one of our participants is, you know, what, what really is sustainability? And you could take that to be what really is a nature-based solution and you know how can we determine if the methods are actually you know sustainable the comment then goes on to say that you know companies have been using the term quite loosely so you know maybe to share some analytical tools so that we could sort of you know uh, understand for ourselves whether some of these initiatives uh, that are being introduced really are as effective as they say they are certainly i think that you know it is a really good question to think about what to what extent are nature-based solutions really delivering on sustainability? I think one of the one of the challenges that we have is that a lot of the analytical tools that we use to monitor, measure and evaluate nature in cities are very singular in their approach so that they focus on one or possibly a few metrics. So they might focus on carbon storage, they might focus on water retention, they might focus on um, air pollution, air quality, 
but very rarely are tools developed that can do all of those things at the same time. So it becomes very complicated for decision makers or those who are seeking to maintain and monitor nature-based solutions over time, including private set, private developers, those who are trying to, uh, community groups, anybody who's trying to implement them, to actually really know what this looks like over time. So there is now an effort to develop multiple indicators for nature-based solutions. The IUCN is developing a set of standards and indicators which is encouraging uh, nature -based, those who are developing and implementing nature-based solutions to use. Um, and at the same time, the European Commission is trying to collect evidence uh, from across the European Commission, but also globally, in order to develop, a, if you like, an indicator bank of tried and tested indicators and methods and tools for measuring these. And what we've tried to do with our and our project is we've developed something called the Naturevation Navigator uh, because we think these are difficult things to navigate, which looks at 12 different sustainable development challenges, identifies about 20, 25 indicators that can be used to, to monitor whether nature-based solutions are meeting those sustainable development challenges and puts them into a matrix. Uh, so we can see that some nature-based solutions perform better on some goals than others, and there are always going to be trade-offs. So it's also knowing those trade-offs between the different sustainable development goals. Um, so, for example, community gardens is very good evidence that they're really useful for health and, and both mental health and physical health, for community cohesion, for improving uh, governance, uh, inclusion, these issues. But the evidence that they're very good, for example, for stormwater retention is, is limited. So you know, you might want to then introduce more mechanisms within such a community garden space to increase their capacity to address that sustainability challenge. Um, whereas usually stormwater interventions are done very technically, they don't involve anybody, nobody really benefits from them in terms of inclusion or participation. So you could learn lessons that way. So we think looking at the trade-offs is also important. And these new approaches to monitoring that cut across different issue areas will help do that as well. Yes, and, and actually while you're answering, I, I think it inspired a follow on question, which I'll skip a few of the other ones just to ask this one, because I, I think it's sort of building on that. But um, it's just a question about the way it's framed is how is it possible to reach full sustainability? But I think the bit that's interesting to me is, do you think that numerical scales are going to be seen as a catalyst for sustainable development? Because obviously we've seen the human development index, we've seen other you know, use of numerical scales to influence and, and maybe just your thoughts on that and what role it might play? Yeah, I, I think numbers do matter a lot uh, for a lot of different organisations and businesses. You know, it is in the end, the bottom line of, of, you know, how much money are we spending? What are we getting back from it? And this can't be uh, underestimated in terms of its importance in driving sustainability forward. But at the same time, sustainability is it's not perfect, it's not going to be complete, and it is really about a whole set of attitudes and approaches to our lives as a whole, right? So it's it's as much a sort of set of ethical and moral and collective approaches to life as it is about the things that you can count. And the important the important things is, of course, as you know, many of us know that most of the important things in life are difficult to count. Uh, yeah. And those sorts of things like the love that we have for nature in our cities is a difficult thing to count. And just because it's difficult to count doesn't mean it's any less valuable. So it's how do we bring the numbers, the metrics alongside a sense of what collectively we decide we want out of the future of our lives. Uh, and those are, those are the difficult things to do. And it's not going to be perfect at any one time. So it plays a role, but obviously by, by no means a, 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 yeah. a silver bullet, as it were. Yeah. And um, there's an interesting question about terminology before we move to some other ones, just around the distinction between natural climate solutions and they put it as versus nature based solutions. And I think it touches on other points you made around ecological, you know, how do we measure right, the benefit and, and it lists ecological impact assessment, social impact assessment, air quality impact assessment. So is there a way in which you might understand natural climate solutions, maybe define it against nature-based solutions and strengths and weaknesses, are they so far apart? Yeah, I mean, I think often these are just labels used by different communities who are working in different arenas. So people who work in the climate arena 
um, both in terms of climate policy and also climate science, tend to obviously see things with a climate lens on. And I'm, I'm certainly somebody who comes from that background. Uh, but I think the interesting things with nature-based solutions is to move beyond just thinking about what the climate services are that nature can provide into this broader sense of thinking of the other services and functions, such as the ones that are listed through all of those different kinds of assessment modes, but also these, these, these more intangible qualities that we've just been discussing. So the ways in which nature makes us feel, the idea that nature could be sacred, the sense that we get um, a sense of connection to ourselves and to others through nature. These things are not necessarily um, at the forefront. If we call something a natural climate solution, we tend to put the climate part first. And I think you know some of the challenge with that, as I alluded to at the beginning of the lecture, is that some of these natural climate solutions will be taking place in areas of the world which are already um, regarded as precious and important by other kinds of communities, whether those are indigenous communities, whether those are local communities, whose values for nature may not be taken into account if they are only labelled as natural climate solutions. Yeah, I, th I think that's really helpful and actually it makes me think of the past lecture we had as well, that somehow if you label it as climate, it's be, it seems more distant as well and also might beg other questions around, of course, the climate might be variable, but that's, you know, also a distraction. So it's interesting how I think terminology matters. There's an interesting question that comes with a picture, which I like, um, of a bus lane. And I, uh, it's a fairly long question. Uh, you can probably look at it later, but I think the way I, I take it is a little bit about how we choose to live in the city. Um, and, you know, there is a way in which we can become closeted indoors. We, you know, we survive all change or even become slightly distant through air conditioned environments and whether using the bike more or using other types of, you know, living in the city differently, maybe. And it also your last slide, actually, when you showed the picture of loving the tree and so on as a as a way of understanding how we engage with nature. So I just wonder whether there was something around how you live in a city that might not be strictly speaking a nature based solution, but, you know, it's about understanding what nature is there in a city. Just a reflection on that. You know, is it biking? Is it something else? What, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think these these questions are really interesting and very important because when we think about urban sustainability, we've got lots on our mind. We've got solar panels, we've got smart tech, we've got, you know, home smart systems, we've got bicycles, we've got, you know, nature, all sorts of different approaches. And in a sense, you know, some, some people say, well, do we want the smart city route or do we want the resilient city route or do we want the nature-based solutions route? But in some senses, like any kind of form of urban development, it's going to be a kind of slightly chaotic mixture of all of those things, right? No, uh, you know, possibly with the exception of cities like Singapore, which I have had the pleasure of visiting on a couple of occasions, uh, very few cities can be as planned and as organised, right? Um, even cities that were historically planned, such as Canberra in Australia or Milton Keynes, closer to home in the UK, uh, even those kind of cities grow, they evolve, they become slightly chaotic. And that, in a sense, is what we like about cities, is that energy, that imagination, that capacity to innovate and to be different. Um, and so what I, my kind of envisage for the future sustainability city is that we'll see all different kinds of aspects of these kind of tangled together. And again, that striving for a kind of utopian vision of one sustainability city would be kind of exclusive as well because different communities will want and think of different things so when it comes to to cycling in the city for me that's got to be a really important part of a sustainability response but for others perhaps it will be the electric scooter i know i find it very difficult to persuade my younger teenage daughters to get on a bike but no problem at all to get them on a scooter. So yeah, I, I wouldn't want to rule, rule them out of being on a scooter or a skateboard as a sustainable means of getting around town just because I prefer the bike, right? I mean, it, it, it has to be diverse, I think. But that doesn't, that also means that we have to create space in cities for these diverse forms of engaging with it. And I think that's what the question is really getting to is, how do we create space in the city for people to find their own sustainability pathways through it, right? Um, but we need to kind of open up that space and then we need to let individuals and communities and different groups find the things which are sustain mean sustainability for them. 
And here I do think nature-based solutions can be important. We've seen a lot of focus on linear parks and routeways through cities being part of what nature-based solutions try to do, to create new pathways which are inviting, which are safe, which are away from traffic, where you want to be because it's a nice environment. Um, and it's cool because <laughs> they're shaded. So, so I think nature-based solutions can help with finding those kind of paths and routeways. But it's for me, it's diversity that matters and making sure that we create space for people to experiment with the different kinds of things which sustainability means for them. You you uh, mentioned electric scooters, and actually I was quite excited to get one in Singapore, and then they got banned because it's it's interesting that um, you know that I I guess that's why the chart of peaks and troughs in nature based solutions. I guess sometimes we rush into solutions and they're not always what we think they are. But I'm sure the electric scooter will come back at some point. We we do have uh, five minutes more for questions. So if anybody would like to raise their hand and ask a question. Uh, you know, you're more than welcome to just use the raise the hand function if you're familiar with it in in teams. I will ask a question, though, that the British Council does like to ask in sort of sessions like this around youth engagement, youth voices uh, and what you think, because a lot of what we're talking about seems very structural, right? It seems very city council, very, um, uh, you know, how would you engage other than advocating? What's the most effective way do you uh, do you think in engaging youth and appreciating these solutions or maybe finding their own nature based solutions, but just to sort of, you know, looking at it from the perspective of, you know, those listening today? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think one of the most effective things to do is just to do some nature in your life, whether it in whichever way it might be. One of the things that we've also seen is what we call in Europe guerrilla gardening. I can't imagine that this is something that is very popular in Singapore, but we see groups uh, of youth and also mixed age groups going out and taking over small areas of gardens which are neglected. That might be around a bus stop, it might be around a bit of a playing field, it might be a roundabout, and then overnight planting it with the things that they want to see in their neighbourhood. So they're a very active ways of just actually getting out and trying to bring more nature into into your life, whether that's in a public space or in a private space. I think there are also lots of ways of just showing and sharing your appreciation for nature um, and bringing this to the attention of different authorities. We see a lots of what are called citizen science apps now. So you can have bird watching apps, plant identification apps, um, weed apps so things that are growing out of pavements that shouldn't be there and lots of lots of people using these um, taking their own photographs posting them sharing them and painting a whole picture of what the city looks like from their perspective with the kinds of nature that they love and they want to be seen with um, and i think just getting those conversations started noticing nature sharing it with others making it important in your everyday conversations in your everyday life whether it's really at the activist end of taking over a roundabout and planting it, or whether it's just a simple conversation with friends. Um, all those different ways of bringing nature into our everyday life are as important if we want to create a city where nature matters in the future. Excellent. So we're getting to that five minutes and 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 I just, you know, maybe this is the right, this is a question to end on, maybe not the right question to end on, but something speaking to me in, a question that was asked beforehand around, you know, with the human impacts on Earth being inevitable and this phrase about getting back to nature, which I think you're advocating something interestingly different, I suppose, about bringing nature to you. And uh, the way that the question ends is about, you know, is it, is it possible for us to get along with nature? I mean, you know, we touched a little bit on around the conceptualization and getting back to nature sounds very romantic and sort of maybe a little nostalgic so I'm just wondering how you might sort of reflect on that getting along with nature bring you know how you might sort of characterize it. yeah I mean in in the nature nation project we talk about it as thriving with nature so we talk about it as having a good life that exists with and around nature and we also think about nature as being extremely diverse and the importance of recognizing that what is valuable in nature to one individual and to one set of communities is not the same for others. So, for example, we know that um, 
sometimes women feel concerned about walking through densely forested areas of cities where which aren't lit, right? Whereas we know that perhaps during the day, bird watchers would love those areas because they would be so biodiverse. So it's about trying to create a balance between different kinds of nature that are valuable to different kinds of community, acknowledging uh, diversity, cultural diversity, historical diversity of nature as well, and not thinking that there's one form of nature that we need to get back to. So there isn't a sort of pure form of nature that is historically relevant to everybody especially when you know when we think about colonial landscapes and post-colonial landscapes and when we think about the climate change of the future i was at the european urban forestry days talks on on tuesday and one of the most interesting talks that i heard was about which tree species that in europe we've come to grow very familiar with and think of as part of our everyday landscape will actually be able to cope in a 20 years time in the climate in europe and the answer is that several of the species that we really know and love like the copper beach are really unlikely to be able to be urban trees mm. for our future cities so so we have to be able to think of nature very flexibly and to think about what kinds of nature can thrive in cities and how we can thrive with it in a diverse way excellent and actually there is a call to action question which i slap myself on the hands for not asking but i'll do my wrap up in one minute do you want to just give a uh, just a just a quick reflection on the sort of courses students those on our call today um, might might look towards uh, to you know that they could undertake to work in this space. Just a, just a quick drop from your academic background there, and what we can do. Yeah, is... sure. I mean, I, you know, I'm a geographer, and I've been a geographer since I was about 13. And you know, my own children <clears throat> who've had to do some homeschooling with me are rather sick of me saying how wonderful geography is. But as a discipline which allows you to work across both science and social science areas, I think it is really a fantastic place to start. There's also, of course, uh, environmental sciences, environmental studies, urban studies and planning, which also contain many of these different aspects. But I'm afraid having done, you know, A-level geography, a degree in geography, a PhD in geography, and now being a geographer, you're only going to get, you know, you're going to get a rather biased answer from me, but I hope that's acceptable. Well, it's good to, it's good to have uh, to have a championing for geography there that's brilliant thank you so much uh so uh thank you uh, uh, uh professor buckley and thank you high commissioner um we will share questions afterwards of course they can reach out to you um and your team in durham with any other questions so hopefully they'll take the opportunity to reach out to you as well um so I hope we will all be leaving the session today with a renewed commitment to engaging with science, education, outreach, discussions that are you know, supportive, positive, successful, thinking about nature in the city. I'm definitely you know, thinking a bit more about that, a bit more adaptive. I'd also like to thank the Singapore Association for the Deaf and Ms. Rashida for supporting us with the sign language interpretation during the session. We will be posting a recording of this video on our Knowledge is Great Lecture website and our social media channels within the next few days. So please feel free to share this with your friends and colleagues who are unable to join us today. Once again, thanks everyone for being part of this great lecture. This now concludes our mini series on climate change and environmental uh, uh, sustainability. However, do remember that we will be continuing to run these lectures once every month. The next session will be on the 29th of April at 5 p.m. Singapore time, where Dr. Fabian Stephanie from Oxford Internet Institute of the University of Oxford will talk to us about the increasing shift towards remote working and the global need for reskilling if the future of work is indeed online. I can't imagine that remote working won't have an impact on climate, so I'm sure it'll all tie in somehow. Um, so thank you, High Commissioner. Thank you, Professor. Luckily, thank you to all of you who joined us today and asked questions before and during the session, and I hope you all have a good weekend. Thank you very much.